Some 15 minutes, seven seconds into John Glenn's second flight into orbit. Everything seems to be working perfectly well on the Space Shuttle Discovery. A fairly flawless picture here at the Kennedy Space Center. I don't know how you could make it look prettier than that. That's just Can you come up with anything? I don't flight. think so. No. Wonderful flight. All right. Do it at night. <laughs> we'll I get more time. nervous watching than being in it. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty. Let's, uh, let's move it along to Houston, which is where NASA has moved things along, so to speak. Control of this mission, of course, taken care of all throughout its nine days at the uh, Johnson Space Center. CNN's Tony Clark is there. Tony? Miles, you're looking at a shot of mission control in the center, and you can just barely see her. She's in a light-colored jacket. That is Linda Hamm. She is the uh, flight director. She has the operational control of this flight. And to her right is, uh, in the dark jacket, is Susan Still. She is an astronaut. She flew twice on missions last year. She is the voice of mission control both to the shuttle and the voice of the shuttle to mission control. It was interesting watching uh, as the launch was being on hold all of the 35 or 40 or so people who were sitting at consoles patiently waiting. And then when the launch happened, it was interesting to note that there are about seven or eight TV monitors in here showing the, the liftoff itself, but no one was looking at those. All of the uh, flight controllers were looking at their screens, data on their screens, monitoring uh, how the liftoff was going of Discovery, because as you know, about 30 seconds into the launch, all of the control shifts from Florida to here, and it will remain here until the shuttle lands. Miles? Tony, uh, give us an idea of what's uh, in store in the next day or so uh, for this mission. Uh, it's a nine-day mission. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, what's on tap right away? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, gets deployed uh, very early on is the uh, a little uh, communication satellite, a little military communication satellite. That will be interesting a couple of days from now. The uh, Spartan satellite will be deployed. That is going to, to look at the, uh, the sun and the sun's corona because the effects of eruptions on the sun uh, have an effect on electrical grids, satellite communication here in the United States. And then there are a whole host of uh, medical experiments that will be performed in the space hab uh, uh, laboratory that is inside the uh, payload base. Just, uh, you know, just shortly after they get on orbit, they will open those payload bays, and um, that's when the experiments begin being exposed. They start turning on systems uh, the rest of the day, getting everything uh, activated. So it's still a lot to be done today. And uh, let's talk, you know, when they, they open those payload days for a very specific reason, uh, Bernard Harris uh, that has a lot to do with the radiating heat in the space. Tell us about that. Yeah, it sure does. And, and that was my job on the last mission was to uh, open up the payload bay doors and also to uh, bring out the anten antenna for communications. The, uh, the doors actually have the radiators and which to radiate heat. Uh, many people think that it's cold in space, and that's true, and it's hot in space, but it's even hotter in the cabin because of all the electronics and avionics computers. They, they give heat. We pull that heat off and we run it through the radiators and radiate that into deep space, and that cools, keeps the, uh, the spaceship cool. You know, one of the things uh, we hear sometimes about, but which astronauts sometimes are reluctant to talk about, is, uh, well, the NASA, NASA euphemism is space adaptation sickness. Uh, and this is when that comes to bear, and this is the most critical time, isn't it, Bernard? Well, you know, it actually starts on the pad. We have learned over the last <laughs> really? 30 years, as you're sitting there for uh, three hours or so in that recumbent position. You have this fluid shift from your legs down to your head, and uh, that begins that process. And then you go in orbit under these G loads, and then uh, eight and a half minutes later, you are exposed to zero gravity. And yes, this is where 60% of the crew members will experience the, the most uh, uh, common space adaptation syndrome, that is space motion sickness. Um, as the medical doctor on board our flight, it was my job to make sure that the crew was stable during that point because they have a lot of activities to do during that day. Without naming names, was it a particularly rough ride for the crew or is it typically okay? Uh, it's typically okay. And when I say 60%, that varies. You know, some people uh, just have a little sensation in their stomach. Others uh, will outright, uh, you know, have to use their, their bags uh, on orbit. Uh, for the most part, uh, you fly the second time and it's much better. Would you concur on that one, Dave? Yeah, I concur. This is an interesting time in orbit. It's very busy. They're converting this rocket ship into a science laboratory. Uh, everybody is active. They're getting out of their spacesuit. There's a lot of movement. It becomes essentially a kelp bed of spacesuits floating around. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, uh, they're adapting to space. Uh, people, 
Pedro Duque, for instance, is his first time in space, and uh, he needs to get adjusted, but he still has a big job to do. Absolutely, yeah. I, I would think... Uh, Let's take a look at the president, by the way. He is at the Launch Control Center taking a walk through. He was on the roof uh, watching the uh, launch from a little better perch than we have right now. Let's take a look at those pictures if we can. And he, he expressed uh, some, some jitters uh, before the uh, actual... Uh, I guess he's uh, in a car on his way there. Is that the... That appears to be a shot uh, from uh, the blimp. In any case, uh, the space adaptation sickness, this is a recurring problem. I don't want to dwell on this because I know you, you guys don't like to talk about it too much, but the fact of the matter is, when you start looking at people, there, there's the president along with uh, the First Lady and in the foreground, Daniel Golden, the NASA administrator. We can't hear what they're saying, but clearly offering some uh, congratulations to the entire launch control team. Anyway, back to, to space uh, uh, sickness. Uh, it's been studied for many years now. That and shuttle, seven to nine times a year. Let's listen they to do it safe and they do it on time except when planes get in our way. Great space team of America, I want to introduce to you a man who cares about our space program. I want to introduce to you the first president of the United States who had the courage to come down here to NASA Kennedy and watch a shuttle launch in real time. I will it's all right. I want to introduce to you a man who cares about America's space program, who cares about America's future. And when we had those battles up in Washington, he made sure we're going to build a space station, Discovery launch Houston, it on November 20th, on December targets. 3rd, and seven launches a year for the next okay, five years. Copy that. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, I have so many things to thank you for today, but among other things, I, I have to thank you for making the First Lady very happy because about a year ago she said, you know, we need to make a list of all the things we want to do before we leave office. And I said, okay, what's on your list? She said, you have to take me to a space launch. I want to go. <laughs> we didn't have the courage to come here. We had confidence in you and pride in America and a conviction that our space program is good for the United States and good for the world. And I want to thank you today because you made all of us terribly proud. Let me also say that uh, because of the intense interest in this, in the media and among ordinary citizens, uh, the American people have had a unique opportunity today to see what you do, not just at the moment of launch, but in the weeks and months and years that preceded all the hard work and all the preparation. And now they will learn over the next few days all the things that are being done in space that advance not only our mission in space, but the quality of our life here on Earth. And all of that, too, has been made possible. The last thing I'd like to say is it has been immensely impressive and important to me to have the chance to work with NASA over the last six years and see the revolution which has uh, been undertaken so that now you can, on virtually the same budget you had six years ago, do eight launches a year instead of two and continue to explore the outer frontiers of space. I thank you for all of that. America is very, very proud of you today. Thank you and God bless you. First president of the United States to witness a space shuttle launch. Only the second president of the United States uh, to be here for an actual launch. John Kennedy never got an opportunity. I'm sure he would have liked to have come and seen one. I'm sure he would have. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we uh, some final thoughts, Bernard. Well, I I guess I would like everybody to know that you know we're here for John Glenn, but they've got a long road ahead of them. The next nine days, they'll be working in the Space Hab module. Uh, that was uh, commercially developed, of course, uh, as part of NASA's new initiative to get per commercial involvement. Eighty-three experiments. That's going to be a, a, a tough mission, but they're up to it. 
and, it, and it's uh, down to the five-minute increments. Dave, any closing comments? Yes, this, this is a typical inter multinational scientific mission, typical of the kinds of things we'll be doing on the International Space Station that we begin launching in about three weeks. Uh, one element from Russia, another from America two weeks later. It's going to be an amazing five years building this station and operating it for 20 years as we conduct research in orbit. Gentlemen, thank you all. Walter, it was a distinct pleasure and an honor. I think we can say one more time that this broadcast was dedicated to John Holloman, who uh, was a space reporter until he died, unfortunately, in an accident a few weeks ago. Uh, I think, uh, Miles, you did a great job. John would be proud of you. I think he was watching somewhere. I hope, hope, he, um, hope he enjoyed the show. Holy cow, what a sight, he probably was saying. Thanks very much to all of you for being with us, and we will continue our coverage all throughout the mission. As always, stay with CNN.